Okay, so I think we will get started if, if uh, everybody is ready. Thumbs up. Uh, can every, I just wanted to check again, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Uh, so hi everyone, welcome. Um, I'm Kim Wood and I'm um, one of the members of the Adult Cystic Fibrosis Advisory Committee uh, or the ACFAC. On behalf of our entire committee, I would like to welcome you all to our third webinar in our educational series on fertility and family planning for people with cystic fibrosis. Um, Cystic Fibrosis Canada's Adult CF Advisory Committee provides perspective and advice on CF-related issues and advocates for public policies and programs to help uh, people with CF. Members also foster and support an engaged and uh, knowledgeable CF community. Among the committee's various initiatives, we are pleased to host this webinar series through which different perspectives uh, and different aspects of fertility and family planning will be discussed by a variety of expert guest speakers as well as people living with CF that are willing to share their personal experiences. Uh, we just wanted to note uh, that this is an educational webinar series. CF Canada cannot provide any medical advice and although the series will feature a few CF clinicians and other health professionals, we highly recommend that all persons with CF seek uh, guidance from their CF clinic care team uh, regarding their personal family planning process. So today uh, we will hear from two health professionals, Dr. Cynthia Brown and Ronalee Robert, who are very knowledgeable in this field, uh, as well as two adults with CF, Melissa Snowden and uh, Emily Brennan, who will be sharing their patient experience with pregnancy. Uh, we will then take questions after hearing from all of our speakers. Um, so, we are honored to be joined today by Dr. Cynthia Brown to speak on our fourth topic of the series, Cystic Fibrosis and Pregnancy. Dr. Brown is the Adult Cystic Fibrosis Director at Indiana University. She was trained in internal medicine and pulmon uh, pulmonary and critical care medicine at John, Hop uh, John Hopkins Hospital, where she was also a chief resident. She has participated in numerous clinical trials in CF, including the pivotal trials for highly effective modulators, and also has research interests in the potential for withdrawal of therapies on patients who are um, on highly effective modulators to reduce treatment burden, which I think we can all agree that, that would be a real treat for people with CF. Uh, she has participated on numerous committees at the CF Foundation and recently co-authored an article about sexual and reproductive health in CF that is in press addressing many of the issues she is discussing today. So, Dr. Brown, it's over to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that kind of introduction and I appreciate this invitation to speak. Um, let me share my screen here. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk today about planning uh, pregnancy uh, in, in patients with cystic fibrosis. I spoke about this topic at the most recent North American Cystic Fibrosis um, meeting and uh, wanted to share a bit with you about that. So in the interest of disclosures, I really have none related to this presentation and I've done a variety of research trials as noted here. Um, my objectives today are to talk to you about how to best plan for pregnancy, to talk a little bit about your, uh, the risk and benefits of medications and antibiotics in CF, and to discuss outcomes of pregnancy. Um, I want to go back in time. Uh, sadly, the first pregnancy in CF, um, first of all, was not reported until 1960. The baby was born early, um, six weeks early, to a 19-year-old woman who unfortunately died three months after birth from respiratory complications of her disease. And at that point in time, um, it was stated that the pregnancy aggravated her underlying pulmonary disease and that um, the unfavorable outcome would suggest that CF was seriously complicated by pregnancy. And for many, many years, most pulmonologists would tell women that they should not become pregnant if they had cystic fibrosis. 
But luckily, now all these years later, we are entering an era where most women enter adulthood with normal or near normal lung function. This is the most recent data from the uh, registry from the United States, the Cystic Fibrosis Registry, looking at FEV1 data over time. And if you uh, look here, that if you look at um, in 2018, only a tiny sliver of women enter adulthood with severe lung disease. If you compare that to 1988, where women were entering um, adulthood, a quarter of them were entering adulthood with severe disease, and um, less than 20% were entering adulthood with normal lung function. But in 2018, we have almost half of women entering their adult life with actually an FEV1 greater than 90%, um, and almost 75% uh, of women having uh, lung function greater than 70%. Uh, as they enter adulthood, which is fantastic when you're thinking about starting a family. Um, and when we kind of go forward as we think about that, this is reflected in the number of pregnancies. Oh, now looking out back over a 20 year time period, the number of pregnancies reported in women with CF on a yearly basis is increasing. So um, it's actually doubled over the past 20 years. And in 2018, in the United States, 280 women were reported to have given birth. Um, and this uh, is possible that this is even an underrepresentation of the numbers of women giving birth in the United States. So um, we are seeing more and more women give birth, and we need to be able to give um, better um, information to these women that are wanting to have babies and start families. And I think what we'll see in the years to come is even more women having healthy childbirth and cystic fibrosis. So we need to pl start planning better for pregnancy. Um, I tell women that they have the exact same contraceptive options as any other uh, patient with cystic fibrosis. Um, and when I talk to women in my clinic, I, when I ask them, are you and your partner using birth control? And if the answer is no, then you definitely need to think about the risk of pregnancy. Um, in women who do not have cystic fibrosis, if you're using any, any withdrawal method or fertility awareness method, your risk of pregnancy in, in one year is 13 per 100 women in one year. Uh, I can think of at least two or three women who became pregnant in the past two years telling me that, oh, well, I haven't been on birth control in X number of years, so I don't think I can become pregnant. And if you are not using birth control, obviously you can become pregnant at any point in time, even if you've never achieved pregnancy previously. So just remember, you know, I always say, well, if you're not using birth control, then, then you're trying to get pregnant. So you need to certainly be very aware of your pregnancy risk. One of the important parts of planning for a pregnancy is um, obtaining genetic counseling. The carrier rate in the Caucasian population is about one in 25 individuals. So if, if you as a woman have CF and your partner is a carrier, then um, your risk of having a child with CF is one out of two uh, chances if the partner is a carrier. And if you're untested, then the risk of a child just randomly having CF would be one in 50. Um, so it's important to be able to plan. Um, some women would say that they don't want to know if uh, they their partner is a carrier and they would take the risk of having a child with CF and that's reasonable. But as someone living with a chronic disease and understanding the burden of care as uh, how high your own personal burden of care is, and thinking about the burden of care of taking care of an infant with CF, I think it's important to be able to plan that, um, whether or not you or your child have CF. Other parts of planning a pregnancy is to set your weight and lung function goals prior to attaining a pregnancy. Uh, the uh, Ronna Lee, who is a, a dietitian and a CF center will be talking a lot more about your nutrition and diabetes management. So I will not touch on that at this point. 
As far as lung function, uh, typically I tell patients that they uh, that I ideally would like to see FEV1 about 50 to 60 percent prior to attaining pregnancy. However, pregnancy successful pregnancy outcomes have been reported in women across um, all uh, lung function. There's more complications and higher risk of preterm birth uh, at lower lung function. Women at lower lung function also need to think about um, other complications. For instance, if their lung function were to go down during pregnancy, um, and what would that mean uh, for a child and their family? I also try to review recent exacerbation history. So if a patient has been in the hospital very frequently prior to getting um, pregnant, what would that mean if the patient is getting ill more frequently going into a pregnancy then this is somebody who's going to be higher risk for repeated hospitalizations during their pregnancy as well um, and is the patient prepared for that certainly going into pregnancy you want to stop any medications uh, that could cause birth defects um, so uh, not very many of our medications that we use on a chronic basis have absolute contraindications. One of the ones that come to mind is uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Things like ibuprofen should not be used. So that's one that we frequently, so that's one of the ones that we usually stop going into pregnancy. Um, we, I do recommend that we perform oral glucose tolerance testing prior to pregnancy. And if a patient is diabetic, we try to optimize diabetes management. So uh, very frequently we get that call. As soon as you see that the, the happy plus sign, uh, we get the call in clinic. I'm excited, but nervous, and sometimes even panicked. What am I going to do? I'm excited, but I want to make sure I'm healthy. I want to make sure my meds are safe. I want to make sure that the baby's going to be safe and not have cystic fibrosis. And if we've done our planning appropriately, we will have already addressed some of these uh, issues. Okay, we want to talk about weight gain. We want to, patients want to know, will their lung function drop and was the baby going to be? So we'll help you through all these things. This is why I'm uh, having good communication and close communication with your clinic is important. That's why CF really is, requires a lot of teamwork and requires your entire multidisciplinary team to do well. In, in most instances with cystic fibrosis, what do we do? We, we go grab our guidelines and say, this is what we need to do in pregnancy. But unfortunately, we don't have evidence-based guidelines and CF is, for in pregnancy, it's a big empty box about what the best thing to do is. Um, in the United States, we have just uh, established a committee to research women's issues in cystic fibrosis. The European um, CF Society published guidelines in 2008, but these guidelines really are primarily just a few case reports and single center experiences. So to be able to say that with any sort of definitive statement that this is the one right thing, it's hard to say. So this is why it's really important to have a good communication with your care team and look at each individual case um, very closely. So I'm showing you the United States FDA Food and Drug Administration risk categories. I communicated with um, Eunice yesterday about Health Canada. Um, and the risk categories mirror these very closely. And I say this with the caveat that each individual patient needs to communicate with their care team about what's right for them and their pregnancy. Um, categories A and B uh, are usually safe. In category A, you, we have controlled studies that show that there's no risk uh, in the first trimester. In category B, there's animal studies that show no risk or, um, or animal studies that show risk that's been not confirmed in humans. In category C and D, there may be some slight risk, but the benefits outweigh risk, or indeed there could be risk in humans. 
In category X, there's definitive uh, teratogenic risk. I like this cartoon infographic a little bit better. In category A, it's A-OK -okay in pregnancy, but really there's just almost nothing in those except for folic acid and unicorn tears. In category B, it does nothing to pregnant rats, so we're pretty sure it's comp pretty sure it's good for humans. Category C, it's done iffy stuff at super high doses. Category D, definitely iffy stuff. And category X will almost uh, guarantee seven belly buttons and a tail. So this is sort of a way to think about it, but I think it kind of brings it home. But what's good? You know, these are the things that we use every day. We usually continue these as prescribed, again, with the caveat that your particular situation could be different, so you need to talk to your, your doctor. Most of the things we use in every day in clinics, such as Dornase, hypertonic saline, azithromycin, estreonam, albuterol, we usually continue those pretty safely throughout pregnancy. Uh, again, your, your, um, some of your oral medications for um, your weight and nutritional status, such as enzymes, your vitamins other than vitamin A, which is a special case that we'll talk about in folic acid. Again, we usually continue those uh, as prescribed. What's bad? Well, the bad that are known to cause congenital defects and that we avoid, none of our routine medications typically fall into this category. So there's nothing that we absolutely stop um, of our routine daily medications for cystic fibrosis. What do we use sort of with that, the, the orange light? What do we use with caution? So the cautionary medicines are where we may have to dose reduce, or we may stop for a period of time and reconsider later in pregnancy. Those would be potentially our inhaled antibiotics. So something like inhaled tobramycin or inhaled colistomethate. So some physicians will continue those. Some physicians say, well, if we have alternatives, we, we will use those alternatives like inhaled estreonam. Um, those are not often absorbed um, much into the body. So the IV route, maybe we try to avoid at certain times uh, during pregnancy or at high doses could cause problems. But usually our inhaled, our typical inhaled dose, they're usually okay. What about CFTR modulators? I have a couple of slides on this. I think in the future, our CFTR modulators are drugs like Ivacaftor or Kalydeco, um, Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor, or it can be. And Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor, or Simdeco, we, we probably are gonna find that they are safe, but we don't have enough data at this time to be able to come up with a definitive recommendation. And then vitamin A, it's a fat soluble vitamin that in women without pancreatic insufficiency at doses higher than about eight to 10,000 units daily cause um, birth defects, particularly cardiac defects. Now in our women with cystic fibrosis who have pancreatic insufficiency, we still don't like to have, take our dose much more than 10,000 units. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing Ronna Lee will probably mention this. But that's something that you're going to need to talk to your obstetrician and your clinical team about what's the right vitamin A dose for you in your pregnancy, because vitamin A deficiency is also problematic. So let's talk about modulators in pregnancy. The animal studies don't show teratogenicity, except for potentially cataracts in juvenile rats. They definitely cross the placenta and they're definitely excreted into breast milk. At the present time, there's only been three case reports published. And I personally have experience for, with two additional patients. Um, and at this time, it's one of those very individualized discussion that a patient would need to have with their doctor about what your risk are with, of withdrawing with the unknown risk of continuing. So it really has to be a personalized discussion. To add to that, at the most recent North American CF meeting, Jennifer Taylor Kauser at National Jewish had 35 women who had continued modulators. There were still some ongoing pregnancies in this group, but at the time she presented, 
or submitted the abstract, there were third, um, out of these 35 women, there had been 27 live births and three miscarriages. There had, some women had dis decided to stop. So there was clinical decline after stopping modulators in three individuals, and all three of those women decided to resume. And there had been no therapy related complications during pregnancy or breastfeeding. And you can see that the women who were on modulators during their pregnancy were, tended to be young, and they tended to have pretty good FEV1s, either on the women on Ivacaftor or Kaleidico had FEV1s that were essentially normal at 95%. And the women that were, women that were either on Simdeco or Acambi had FEV1 uh, on average about 74%. And they had normal, F, uh, body mass index around 23. So this was a really healthy group of women that continued on modulators throughout their pregnancy. So the data we have at this point in time tended to show that the women were doing pretty well. Now the, the flip side of that is what is the risk to stopping modulators? These were not women or, or pregnant. These were actually two men and one woman. And these asterisks show wh what happens after stopping. This was a point, the, the dotted line shows that this was a point at which the last FEV1 we had before the modulator was stopped and an FEV1 when people stopped modulators. So sometimes people, when people abruptly stop modulators, we know that their FEV1 can abruptly decline. And in this one instance here led to, um, could lead to potentially to death in this one individual. So we have to very carefully weigh um, what could happen if someone stops modulators abruptly? What about exacerbations? Would you treat an exacerbation any differently in pregnancy? Most of the medications we use to treat exacerbations are fine in pregnancy, although we cannot use things like doxycycline, tetracycline, or minocycline, as that can cause permanent staining of the teeth. And we cannot use um, trimethoprim sulfa, things like Bactrim, um, in pregnancy because that can cause folic acid, abnormal folic acid metabolism and what they call neural tube defects. Obviously, you don't want to uh, antagonize folic acid in pregnancy. The probably okay medications that we frequently use are things like linazolid, IV aminoglycosides, IV tobernicin after the first trimester are probably okay. But if we need to use aminoglycosides, I more often err on the side of using the inhaled medications. And then um, things like Cipro, uh, the fluoroquinolone category, large case series show that those are probably okay. What about pregnancy outcomes for the baby? Mo again, we're looking at mostly small reports. Um, it does show that there's a slight increased risk of preterm delivery and a slight increased risk of C-section delivery with the greatest risk of both of those if the mom's FEV1 is less than 50 to 60 percent are predicted. And this graphic over here shows an FEV1 here and that the lower your FEV1 is, the, uh, the greater the risk of preterm delivery is. Um, what about just kind of generally, what is the effect of pregnancy on breathing? This is not CF. So I just want to highlight before we talk about what is the risk of pregnancy on FEV1 or lung function decline. So if you just think about what pregnancy does to breathing, this happens to everybody. So you're, so this is non-pregnant and this is a pregnant state. Obviously your diaphragm is going to go up. This is going to affect dropping some of your, your um, respiratory reserve. So if you see reserve volume, but your overall vital capacity does not change in a normal person. A normal person will breathe a little bit faster, but the vital capacity doesn't change. So you feel more short of breath, but your vital capacity does not change. Just to highlight that. What about a woman with SIA? If you compare women with SIA to women without SIA, this is a large 
um, claims database in the United States comparing over 1,000 women who gave birth with CF to more than 12 women without CF. Um, women with CF were more likely to have diabetes, more likely to have anemia, more likely to have pneumonia, more likely to have respiratory failure, and more likely to go on a ventilator around the time of birth. Now, this is still really rare. Um, however, this requires on those discharge diagnoses codes, so it's not clear how many of these really occurred. Um, if this is real, if this was truly CF or not, but I think it's often rare to have somebody code as a cystic fibrosis not to have cystic fibrosis. So I would say when you compare women with CF to women without CF, they would have more comorbid conditions, longer hospital stays, and higher medical charges. And if you look in the long term, women with CF have, the, and this was from the Cystic Fibrosis Registry in the United States. Women after birth had more exacerbations, but they did not have more loss of lung function or um, change in their body mass index. So this was looking women who'd had um, CF, they had more IV ex treated exacerbations, more clinic visits, um, and more sick visits, but not more well clinic visits. And perhaps this reflects um, the fact that if you're raising a small child, think about the fact that small children have more viral infections as well. So they're gonna be exposed to a greater infectious risk. So I'm gonna end here um, with a thought that this recent initiative in women's health and more study in cystic fibrosis is needed. However, I think it's very encouraging that we see this increasing number of pregnancies in CF and that more that our pregnancies are doing well these days, although it's not without a slight increased risk of complications compared to women without cystic fibrosis. So I think we take questions at the end. And with that, I think I'll hand it over to Rana Lee to talk about nutrition. Uh, before we do that, I'll just step in and um, thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for that really great, um, very informative presentation. Um, that was really interesting hearing about particularly the modulator medications um, and how they affect pregnancy. So thank you so much. Uh, at this time, we're going to hear from Ronalee Roberts and um, before we turn it over to Melissa and Emily for their patient experiences. So we are also honored to be joined today by Ronalee Robert, who will be further speaking on cystic fibrosis in pregnancy. Ronalee Robert obtained her Bachelor of Science from the University of British Columbia and went on to graduate from the dietetics program at Royal Columbian Hospital. Areas of interest include nutrition in pregnancy in women with CF, as well as CF-related diabetes. She has been working as a registered dietitian at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto in the adult CF program since 2001. So without further ado, Ron Lee, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks very much. I'm happy to be here today. Um, I'm just gonna bring up my slides. Uh, go. Are you guys able to see them? Yes, we are. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'm gonna try, I have a lot of material to go through, but I'm gonna try and get through it as quickly as possible just so we don't miss out on um, the other speakers. Um, so I'm focusing on nutrition and the challenges that we face in pregnancy to optimize it. I'm gonna focus on um, some things, uh, the following things, preconception, uh, optimizing nutrition ahead of time, um, weight gain both before and during pregnancy. I'll talk a bit about diabetes in pregnancy and how to manage it, and also highlight a little bit about breastfeeding postpartum. Um, so pre-pregnancy nutritional advice in CF is associated with greater weight gain during pregnancy and heavier babies. For this reason, a detailed preconception nutrition assessment is recommended prior to pregnancy, um, and it's also very important during this time to discuss what the energy needs are during and after pregnancy. So briefly, I, um, 
nutrition assessment before pregnancy kind of highlights the following. So we would ask a woman um, basically their weight history, we'd obtain their weight, their height, their BMI, and just to see if they're within target or if there's things that we need to help them work on. I would do a dietary assessment. I'd pay attention to their folic acid and calcium intake to see if we need to supplement additionally. Um, fat soluble vitamin levels should, and trace elements where required should be measured and supplemented as needed prior to pregnancy. We review the intake of all their vitamins, dietary supplements, which include non-prescription medications. It's really important at this time to review enzyme dosing, any GI symptoms and absorption issues that may exist prior to pregnancy. Also, we look at their diabetic status using an oral glucose tolerance test, or if they already have diabetes, um, help optimize their blood sugar control. It's a time where we can increase awareness of food safety issues, alcohol avoidance, and also how to limit caffeine consumption. And it serves as an opportunity for women to bring up their other nutrition and pregnancy-related questions they might have. So preconception, um, two targets that we focus on quite a bit are weight and diabetes. So uh, for the general population, it's recommended to have a BMI of 18.5 to 24.9. However, we know in CF that a BMI of greater than 22 is considered to be optimal and has better outcomes. So we encourage women to be as close to this BMI as possible. Um, we may you know, give more dietary advice on how to increase their fat and calories from their usual foods, but if um, they're still having difficulty gaining weight, we can recommend oral nutrition supplements or enteral feeds may even be um, suggested. If a person um, does seem to need more support, um, this, such as enteral feeds, it may sort of indicate that during pregnancy it might be more of a challenge to achieve the increased energy requirements of pregnancy. From a diabetes perspective, the general population, the A1C target um, for people with diabetes and during a pregnancy with gestational diabetes, the A1C, which is a three-month measure of blood sugar control, should be less than 6.5% for best outcome. Um, there is a poor prognosis for poorly controlled diabetes during pregnancy. And women with CF are at higher risk for gestational diabetes, uh, up to three to 10 times higher risk for developing it during their pregnancy. So again, it's important to make sure that oral glucose is up to date. Um, also, if people are sick prior to pregnancy, we encourage people monitoring their blood sugars because it can kind of unmask that there may be a more of a chance they'll have diabetes during pregnancy if their numbers are high during an exacerbation. Weight gain targets during pregnancy are the same for the general population. It's recommended that they gain 25 to 35 pounds. Um, and there are barriers to weight gain that can occur for both the people with CF and the general population, which I'll outline below here. Um, the symptoms are common for both. Um, however, given the high uh, calorie needs that women with CF have, it may make their, if they experience a lot of these symptoms, it can make their um, ability to gain weight much more difficult. So nausea and vomiting are pretty common symptoms. Most people kind of know about that and expect to potentially deal with them in the early part of pregnancy. Um, this can be helped with small carbohydrate-rich snacks and meals every two to three hours. Sometimes avoiding drinking fluids at meals can be helpful. Um, also in CF, um, particularly uh, with a lot of coughing and as the baby gets big and takes up a lot of room, there could be later in pregnancy more vomiting associated with coughing. Reflux is a common GI symptom that a lot of women with CF um, and all CF patients actually experience uh, more frequently than the general population. Um, pregnancy can exacerbate this, so there are some strategies we can suggest to help decrease symptoms, things like raising the head of the bed, eating meals earlier in the evening, having more small frequent meals can be helpful. Um, it, sometimes it's beneficial to liaise with the physio to um, come up with strategies to help uh, avoid uh, reflux after therapy, so one suggestion can be to avoid um, chest physio really soon after eating meals. If a person is struggling with reflux and has tried a lot of these strategies, um, it is important to know that there are medications that are safe in pregnancy that can help with reflux, and you can talk to your clinic um, doctors and pharmacists about that. Constipation is also kind of a chronic um, issue that a lot of people with CF deal with, um, and it can actually worsen during pregnancy due to progesterone slowing down small bowel activity. Um, taking things like iron supplements can also worsen it, and this may precipitate um, partial blockages like the IOS. 
So again, with all these symptoms, it's really important to um, be aware that they could crop up during pregnancy, and if they do, when you're pregnant, to talk to your team because they are treatable, and we can help you do that. And hopefully, um, by managing these, these symptoms, it can help keep the weight gain as best as possible. Um, so gestational diabetes, um, because women with CF are at higher risk for diabetes, it's recommended to do a two-hour 75-gram oral glucose tolerance test um, each trimester. Um, it's the same test that people do annually in their clinic. However, we add in an extra blood draw at one hour. Um, so this should be done at the onset of pregnancy if there wasn't a normal oral glucose within the previous six months. And then it's recommended to be repeated at both 12 to 16 weeks, and then if it's normal, again, at 24 to 28 weeks. If a person does have gestational diabetes, the oral glucose is then again repeated 6 to 12 weeks postpartum. Management of, di of gestational diabetes is different from the general population in CF due to um, the high energy needs that need to be achieved for weight gain. So we recommend that people do not restrict their carbohydrates, they maintain their high calorie intake. And if levels are high after meals, they should be taking, we recommend um, people taking insulin with their meals and snacks as needed. The main uh, dietary changes that may be involved can be things like um, having your simple sugars or your supplements, that, uh, anything that's quite sugary, taken at mealtimes, because if um, you take carbohydrates with mixed meals, protein and fat can help um, decrease the peak of the blood sugar. Um, also, um, choosing low-carb, more high-calorie snacks like cheese, nuts, seeds, meat in between meals can be helpful for smoothing out the spikes. Um, and again, for a good outcome for both mom and baby, frequent monitoring of blood sugars to achieve these tight targets during pregnancy, uh, along with team support, um, ensures best outcome. So the main vitamins and minerals that I'll focus on um, are those that are really important within pregnancy um, and potentially need to be adjusted or supplemented further. Um, so that's uh, folic acid, iron, calcium, vitamin D, and vitamin A, and I'll just talk a little bit about each one over the next few slides. So folic acid supplementation should be supplemented at least three months prior to conception and during the first trimester in these levels. So for healthy women, it's recommended to have 400 micrograms per day. Um, those at moderate risk should have one milligram daily, so that includes people with diabetes, epilepsy, a family history of neural tube defects, malabsorptive diseases like Crohn's, celiac, and of course CF, um, things like advanced liver disease, those on dialysis, or people with alcohol overuse should be taking a milligram daily. Those at higher risk are, um, should be taking four to five milligrams, and those are people with a personal history of neural tube defects. Once you get past the first trimester, uh, the dose for all women can be between 400 to one milligram daily and it's recommended to continue this six week, at least six weeks postpartum or for as long as a person is breastfeeding. Iron deficiency is really common in CF and even healthy women without CF may not be able to meet the demands of pregnancy. So it's recommended to increase dietary iron intake through an iron rich foods like meat, lentils, and dark leafy green vegetables. And to help optimize this absorption of iron, um, vitamin C can be added or um, vitamin C rich foods can be taken at the same time as uh, you take your dietary iron. The CF pregnancy guidelines uh, recommend to measure ferritin at 20 weeks. In our program in Toronto, we actually measure each uh, ferritin each trimester when we check uh, fat soluble vitamin levels. And if the levels are low, they should be supplemented accordingly and monitored. Calcium um, is recommended to, for all women, for all healthy women, before and during pregnancy to be taken um, through food or uh, supplements to be 1,000 milligrams daily. There's no evidence in CF to suggest that it should be higher. However, we do try to recommend in our clinic up to 1,500 milligrams per day just to ensure um, that we're covering any lost um, calcium through malabsorption. And people can get um, adequate intake through calcium-rich foods like milk, yogurt, or cheese, or if um, they're unable to consume enough, we can add supplements to meet those needs. Vitamin D, um, many women with CF are already on high doses of vitamin D due to malabsorption, or in Canada, we don't have enough sun to uh, get levels high enough year-round. 
Um, there are studies that do show that vitamin D supplementation during pregnancy can decrease the risk of preeclampsia, low birth rate, or preterm birth. It's also been shown that low maternal vitamin D intake in pregnancy is associated with neonatal hypocalcemia, which is associated with seizures, also impaired growth and bone development, asthma, and respiratory infections. So for this reason, we recommend all individuals with CF maintaining a serum level of at least 75 nanomoles per liter. So um, as Dr. Brown already mentioned, um, vitamin A is a somewhat controversial vitamin in pregnancy. Um, I won't go into too much detail about um, the effects of either high or low levels because uh, it's already been covered. Um, but the controversy kind of involves the fact that it's preformed vitamin A that can be um, responsible for birth defects early on. Um, however, beta carotene, which is a component of vitamin A, is not known to be teratogenic. And if we look at uh, CF-specific multivitamins, um, it's actually a mix of both preformed and beta carotene. So it's often difficult to know exactly how much preformed vitamin A people are taking in. The CF pregnancy guidelines from 2008 do recommend uh, levels less or doses less than 10,000 international units per day, but that's based on the general recommendations for the general population and pregnancy. So there aren't any specific um, studies that have focused on CF and vitamin A levels and outcomes. Um, and then even the studies that have been done for the general population, it focuses on intake, not necessarily serum levels. Um, most clinics should be monitoring levels annually. Um, and based on that, our, our clinic's um, protocol is to actually ensure prior to pregnancy that on uh, women's current doses of vitamin A, they are within normal targets of vitamin A levels in their blood. So then we continue them on that dose. We measure each trimester. And, and generally, our experience has been that the vitamin A levels, if they're normal on their normal dosing, remain the same throughout pregnancy. But at this time, it's, um, the guidelines have to go along with what the, the recommendations are of less than 10,000 per day. But again, it's very individualized, and you should be followed closely by your clinic with regards to that. So finally, I'll just talk briefly about breastfeeding. Um, there years ago was um, debate whether the composition of breast milk was, was normal in CF, and studies have shown that it is. Um, there is some evidence during exacerbations the concentration of some of the macronutrients um, can be reduced, but again, it's short-term and not necessarily um, should be a deterrent in a woman choosing to breastfeed. We do know breast milk is the optimum choice for infant nutrition, but we do respect a mother's choice of feeding method um, and encourage them and support them in any way we can to um, have their wishes um, fulfilled. Um, it's important to consider the social supports that a woman has postpartum as well as their nutritional status before and during pregnancy. Um, we do get concerned if weight gain was poor during pregnancy or if they're losing weight too quickly postpartum. Um, for those, uh, if those things are happening, we may need to recommend formula or um, breastfeeding and a combination of formula for supplements. The reason um, breastfeeding can be a bit more challenging for women with CF postpartum is that it does require um, a lot of extra calories, up to 800 calories per day, 11, an additional 11 grams of protein, and two liters of fluid. Um, new moms are very busy looking after their babies in general, and then if you factor in all that uh, women with CF have to do to maintain their health, all their therapies, it can be very challenging. Um, the other thing to consider with breast milk is that some CF-related medications can be passed through the breast milk, so it's important that meds should be reviewed um, at the clinic or by a pharmacist, by a person's uh, respirologist. So just to summarize, um, there are many nutritional challenges during pregnancy and prior to pregnancy, including weight gain, diabetes, and breastfeeding. Um, we do uh, really try to intervene with um, weight gain during pregnancy and even uh, before pregnancy just to help optimize the health of both mom and baby. It's very important. Sometimes we have to be quite aggressive in um, helping women with their weight. It's very important to monitor vitamin levels every trimester and supplement as needed. Um, and of course, regular follow-up and uh, working with your team are required for the best outcome for mom and baby. 
thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, John Lee, <clears throat> for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. That was a really helpful inf um, and informative uh, presentation, so thanks so much. Um, I just want to say again that in addition to the information shared by all of our speakers today, we do highly recommend that all persons with CF seek guidance from their CF clinical care team uh, regarding their personal family planning process. So we will now hear from two adults with CF on their experience with pregnancy before we take any questions. Um, Emily Brennan is our, is our first speaker. Um, she's a 32-year-old woman with CF um, from Saskatchewan. She was diagnosed with CF when she was three months old and has two copies of Delta F508. Uh, she is an exec executive assistant at a country club and has a two-year-old son named Declan. She loves hosting family and friends and traveling to visit family as her parents live on Vancouver Island and her husband's family is in Ireland. Emily was not able to join us live today, but she did send in a video of her speaking on her experience um, that we will now play for you. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, as Kim mentioned, my name is Emily Brennan. Um, a little bit of a brief history of my CF would be that other than, other than some challenges as a newborn and some challenges when I was going through my rebellious phase in high school, uh, my CF has been generally very well controlled until shortly after the birth of my son. Um, and I, I definitely found the pressures and strains of being a parent took a toll on my treatment compliance and my ability to put my health first. Um, so getting started, after my husband and I met, we were together for a couple of years. We knew we wanted to start a family together. And even though we weren't yet married, we decided to start trying for a family while we felt that my health was really good. Uh, unfortunately, we were almost immediately delayed by a diagnosis of cervical cancer, uh, which for all we knew was going to take away any chance of having a family naturally for us. Um, I was able to get in within a few months for surgery, which removed the cancerous cells, but left my cervix intact in order to have children. Uh, but we had to wait a number of months to recover from the surgery and to ensure that the doctors felt that all the cancerous cells were removed in order to start trying again. Um, when we were able to start trying, our journey into parenthood was already pretty stressful just from the rocky start. Um, we actively tried for two years before um, getting into a fertility clinic and receiving fertility treatments. Uh, for fertility treatments, we did five unsuccessful um, intrauterine inseminations and eventually decided to try for IVF. At that point, we did also do genetic counseling um, for my husband. We felt that we would proceed even if he was a carrier of the of a CF gene, although looking back now, I don't know if I would have made the same decision. Um, because my husband is Irish, we were a bit more nervous um, as the prevalence for being a carrier for the defective CF gene is higher in Ireland than it is in Canada. Um, we're one in 25 people and they are one in 19 people. So we were really thrilled to find out he was not a carrier for any of the known mutations. Um, and at that time, we also had a big decision to make as the fertility clinic we went to had a wait list and our opportunity to do IVF treatments came about 12 months before our wedding was scheduled to take place in Ireland. Uh, but we decided to go ahead with it as we'd already waited so long and we didn't want to miss the opportunity. So we figured if it worked, it would be a good problem to have and that we would have a newborn with us at our wedding. Uh, the medications and testing that was required with IVF was certainly stressful. Lots of appointments and injections, et cetera, which is nothing new for somebody with CF, but I think that it was more stressful because we felt like we had to keep everything so secret and so private. And looking back, I wish that I had been more open with friends and family who would have been supportive. Uh, they were able to collect 10 eggs, uh, nine of which were successfully fertilized, but only four of which made it to day five blastocysts. Uh, we determined that my health was strong enough for a fresh embryo transfer and we transferred one embryo and the only other one that was 
there was only one other embryo that was of high enough quality that the clinic would freeze it. So it was kind of like we had two shots at this. Um, but after what felt like the longest two weeks of my life, we were lucky enough to be told that we were pregnant. And at nine weeks, we saw our baby's heartbeat. And after 12 weeks, we were then referred from the fertility clinic to a high-risk obstetrician and a maternal fetal medicine specialist. During my second trimester, I would see both of those specialists once a month. Um, as we did have concerns that A, I would develop gestational diabetes, and B, that my weight gain would be sufficient uh, throughout the pregnancy. I haven't had weight issues as a CF patient, but I definitely did not put on a lot of weight in pregnancy. Um, but the baby continued to be happy and healthy, so my specialist didn't really push gaining extra weight on me. Um, I continued with my regular CF diet, though I did do my best to try and cut out unnecessary sugars where I could. I saw my clinic, um, my CF clinic, once each trimester, and my lung function remained really stable throughout my pregnancy. Uh, my FEV1 remained in the 90th percentile throughout my pregnancy. In my third trimester, my obstetrician did increase my appointments to be every two weeks um, with both of those specialists. So I would have one appointment every two weeks with them. And then the last eight weeks of my pregnancy, I was in every week. They did do two additional scans uh, or, or ultrasounds, sorry, as well in my third trimester related to ensuring that baby's growth was appropriate. Um, I was pretty uncomfortable at this point and did find that doing cardiovascular exercise, which was usually my preferred type of physio, was getting really tough to do. I probably should have started doing more, you know, Therapep and other types of physio at that stage to prepare my body for giving birth and everything that comes after it. But that definitely fell by the wayside for me. During my third trimester, my obstetrician also got me to have a consultation with an anesthetist to talk about pain management during delivery. When I walked into that appointment, I felt like I really wanted to give labor a try on my own and use things like an epidural or other medications only if I felt like I needed them. The anesthetist was someone who I knew personally and someone who I knew was a real innovator in his field. Um, so when he told me that he felt strongly that an epidural would be the best way to go, I was disappointed, but I also just really wanted what was going to be safest for me and my baby. Um, he explained to me that when our muscles contract, they use an enormous amount of our body's oxygen, and the uterus is a huge muscle that would require a lot of my oxygen to get through labor. He noted that having an epidural would help me manage my oxygen levels the best because it would help manage the pain. Um, I had had a bad experience with having a spinal block before my cervical surgery, and so we did discuss some of those same risks with an epidural. And I do think that if I'd felt really strongly about not having an epidural, he would have supported me. But I had a pretty good trust in his abilities, and I respected his advice, and I agreed that it would be our plan to have an epidural. Uh, I worked pretty much full time until 38 weeks, which I look back on now and just think that I was absolutely crazy to do that. But I felt like I had something to prove at the time, I think. Um, my obstetrician had delicately suggested I should start uh, thinking about reducing work around 32 weeks, but I was stubborn and didn't realize that how much I should have been preparing and resting my body in advance of motherhood. So I started my mat leave officially at the end of the day on a Friday and gave birth by the wee hours of the morning on Wednesday the next week. Um, so I didn't get much of a chance to rest beforehand. I did develop gestational diabetes in my third trimester and started first just on a long acting insulin only, but then we ended up having to adjust that and adding a fast acting insulin in the morning with breakfast where my sugars were not great. Um, but that was well managed. And in the end, I gained just 13 pounds, but I had a happy and healthy seven and a half pound baby boy at 38 weeks and three days gestation. 
at my 38 week appointment, which was on a Monday, I was told that we needed to try and induce labor before 39 weeks um, because of some risks associated with having gestational diabetes. So we stripped membranes and hoped for the best, uh, but also scheduled me to be induced on the Wednesday in case things didn't get moving on their own. By Tuesday evening, I was feeling funny, but didn't have any signs of labor when suddenly my water broke. Um, I calmly got ready for the hospital as my husband ran around the house frantically getting things ready. And it was definitely all that the movies had promised to see him so nervous. Um, at the hospital, they confirmed that my water had broken, put on a fetal heart rate monitor. Um, the baby's heart rate was steady, but after a number of hours, my labor hadn't progressed and they became concerned that the baby's heart rate was not increasing and decreasing as it typically should during labor based on the baby's activity. My obstetrician was on shift at the hospital and she indicated that it would be best to stimulate contractions with some Pitocin to get things moving. A little while after the Pitocin, I suddenly had a really big contraction and up until that point, I, I hadn't felt anything. So we weren't really worried about any pain management such as the epidural. But when I had this contraction, I think I yelled, the, the fetal heart monitor went crazy. And my husband told me later that the baby's heart rate had actually dropped from 150 to 30 when that contraction hit. So nurses rushed in, we got me into a position that increased the baby's heart rate, but my obstetrician at that point told me that um, we were just gonna need to do an emergency C-section as soon as possible. Unfortunately for me, she was the only high-risk obstetrician that was on shift that night, and there was another more emergent patient. So I just got to wait there in this crazy position, going through all these contractions, which I've been told that the stimulated contractions can be worse um, than when they're more gradual and come on naturally. So I didn't have any pain management or epidural or anything else because they knew that they would be doing a C-section and they needed to do a spinal block instead, which is just an injection versus more of an IV that goes in, like more of a tube that goes in when you get an epidural. So they couldn't do anything for my pain management. And I remember being really nervous because, you know, the anesthetist's words were echoing in my head about how being in pain makes us huff and puff and stop breathing and I was worried about the baby and stuff so it was it was not a fun time but um we did eventually get into the OR um my poor husband by the time that he came in though my adrenaline was peaked so my body was shaking pretty uncontrollably so I think when he came into the OR and it was pretty scary for him to see me in that condition um but it got all got way way better um when Declan was born and we heard him cry and we knew that it was all going to be okay um after Declan was born we had to do blood sugar testing on him for, uh, every hour for the first 12 hours and then once more at 24 hours old because of my gestational diabetes they want to make sure that nothing um affects the baby with that um, my blood sugars were also tested um, following the, the delivery and then months later as well, but we both ended up being fine with no lasting effects from those gestational diabetes. So we're really lucky. Um, we quickly enlisted help from family. Uh, initially, we, we wanted to do everything ourselves postpartum to give us, you know, chance to bond as a family, but we learned pretty fast that we needed help to, so that I could recover, so that we could get our feet under ourselves. Um, postpartum recovery from my C-section went reasonably well. We were in the hospital for about three days following delivery, had some issues with my iron levels after I was discharged, and we had some worry I was going to be readmitted, but managed to improve with some adjustments to iron supplements. The incision was definitely tricky when you're coughing a lot. I was lucky enough that I didn't cough a ton during my recovery and just did my best to support the incision when I needed to cough and clear my lungs. Uh, I hate to say it, I have had a decline in my health since our son was born. Uh, most significantly, it started around when he was 10 months old and I had to do my first round of IVs since I was about 17 years old. And since then, I've probably been on IVs or oral antibiotics about every two or three months. Um, I think that a piece of that decline is definitely from being a new parent and just having less opportunities for self-care and compliance. 
But I also think a big part is just having CF and that at some point our disease really rears its ugly head and that's just what happens, right? I have missed a lot of work and we've had to ask for a lot of help from family and friends, but I'm hoping that this is just, you know, a rough couple of years. We can put it under our belt and move on from here. And I've even recently gotten access to Simdeco. So I'm definitely trying to be as positive and proactive about my health uh, as much as I can be so that I can be here for my family for as long as I can. Um, that's really all that I had to say. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me. All right. Uh, so Emily, of course, is not live with us, but uh, I did want to thank her so much for sharing her um, experience with us. Uh, I'll now introduce um, Melissa Snowden. Uh, she's a 35-year-old uh, wife and mother who has cystic fibrosis. Uh, Melissa enjoys the little things in life, a lover of reader, drinking tea while um, cuddled, cuddled up in a blanket, wearing comfy pair of sweatpants, which uh, <clears throat> I think um, all of us can, can uh, enjoy as well. Uh, she's currently a stay-at-home mom due to a rough patch um, with her health at the beginning of 2019. She keeps busy by teaching prenatal yoga, mommy and baby yoga, as well as kundalini yoga classes every week. Yoga has really been a saving grace for uh, this year while trying to get her health back on track. When Melissa is not teaching yoga, she is walking their new puppy uh, or cheering her eight-year-old son on in hockey. Melissa has a younger sister who also has cystic fibrosis and is uh, recently a double lung transplant recipient. Uh, Life has not always been easy, but it sure has been worth it is the motto Melissa likes to live by. So uh, Melissa, I'll turn it over to you. <coughs> Thanks so much, Kim. Um, so really quickly, with my CF part of myself, I was diagnosed at eight weeks old. Um, and for the most part of my life, aside from a hospital visit when I was five, um, right until high school, I was really healthy. Um, then from high school on, I've been hospitalized probably yearly is the norm. Um, and then other than I have a tube feed, uh, I now have a port cath because my arms just were not loving the um, midlines and, and such anymore. Um, I also have mild CFRD. Um, I've been very, very lucky with my cystic fibrosis journey. So before I get into my pregnancy story, just a little disclaimer that there's a couple parts where I get a bit emotional, so I'm going to apologize for that. <clears throat> and um, my journey is not what I would say physicians would recommend, so please don't use my journey as the basis for, <laughs> for your journey. Mine worked out amazingly, but it's, it's not always the case. Um, I think having a plan, being healthy and prepared, is usually the realistic least smarter way to do this pregnancy thing. However, life tends to step in at times and bowls you over with other plans. So 10 years ago, I was living in Calgary, Alberta. My life was what I would say probably at an all-time low point. Um, I just ended a relationship which had us call off our wedding. I moved into my own apartment and I started a fresh life. I remember feeling very lost and very homesick for my family who lived in Ontario. Determined to persevere, I stayed in Calgary for one more year, post-apocalypse. It was that time the homesickness became worse, and I knew if I was going to move forward with my life and heal properly, I would have to move home. So January 30th, 2011, Nearly nine years ago, I boarded a plane with a one-way ticket back home. I felt a sense of relief, mixed in with sadness, but knew it was going to be all okay. Moving provinces is tough, y'all. It means selling stuff, cleaning two places, in my case, my apartment and my condo, which, by the way, is a story for another day, packing and shipping your things across country, all while grieving the loss of a life you once knew and having to deal with a not so patient father. Sometimes, something he and I can joke about now, <clears throat> we like to call it 
dad helping Mel move home with a cat version of himself. It wasn't pretty, but it gives us a good laugh. Needless to say, when we landed home to Ontario and I unloaded myself into my childhood bedroom, I was exhausted, physically and mentally. I rip Van Winkled my way through life the week following my move. I had never been so tired and exhausted in my entire life. I slept 15 hours one day. The next day was 17. My body was so intensely tired. I would sleep, eat, do my tube feeds and treatments, and sleep again. <clears throat> Five days after my move, I was watching a movie with a girlfriend of mine, in, and in the movie, the character is late and thinks she might be pregnant. My face fell. My girlfriend looked at me and laughed. I hadn't had a period since Christmas. It was now February 5th. My boobs were becoming increasingly sore and larger. So to be safe, I thought I should buy a pregnancy test. To be fair, my periods had never really been on time. <clears throat> and it wasn't highly unusual to be a week to 10 days late especially during high stress times in my life, like being sick or the move I just made. I immediately went to shoppers after leaving her house and got a test. It's recommended when doing a test that you take it first thing in the morning. I couldn't wait. I took it right away. Five plus weeks is what that test said. I was in total shock. I was single. I was living with my parents again. I had no job no future plans, and above all, I had CF, which thankfully at that time was well controlled and stable, but what was pregnancy going to do? Admittedly though, on top of all of that, I was excited. <clears throat> I always wanted to be a mommy since I was two years old. I felt like, although my life was not in order, I had won the lottery. Now, to tell my family, Oh, everyone was shocked, worried, and some even gently tried to tell me to not continue with the pregnancy. Oh, in a st stubborn CF fashion way, I just couldn't listen. I knew deep down that I could grow this baby and bring it into the world. I knew I could raise him or her regardless of our circumstance. Did I feel selfish? Oh, you bet. Who was I anyway? A single mom with CF? What if something happened to me? But I was determined to stay healthy, strong throughout all of this. <clears throat> that determination pulled me through a total of 17 weeks in the hospital while pregnant. Not consecutively, but over the course of the entire pregnancy. That determination saw me through one of the scariest bouts of hemoptysis I ever experienced um, where I actually thought I was dying. It was really frightening. Um, that determination also grew life and vaginally birthed a little boy, six pounds, one ounce. Now, if I could only find the determination to raise a saucy eight-year-old son. The pregnancy itself was beautiful. I had no morning sickness, some mild nausea, aches and pains as my body grew, but aside from the initial exhaustion, that baby was good to me. My lungs, on the other hand, were not. I had four exacerbations while pregnant, and because they worried about the baby and I, <clears throat> they would, I would be hospitalized on IV antibiotics that were safe for pregnancy, as most of the oral antibiotics I could take were not. So I stayed patient and positive in order to stay sane while hospitalized. Like I mentioned earlier, I also have CFRD and went off insulin while pregnant and have stayed off insulin since being pregnant because for some miraculous, mysterious, bizarre reason, my pancreas decided to work properly again, which still remains a mystery to my endocrinologist and everyone else. The final five weeks, I was in the hospital waiting for baby's arrival. On Labor Day Monday, my water broke, which was five weeks early. 
It truly was Labor Day for me. I don't like to brag about this part, but I was a total badass. I was in labor for a total of 16 hours, did all my treatments while in labor, had the physiotherapist give me physio, much to his dismay, as I was seven centimeters dilated. Contractions came and went, and I breathed through them like a boss, with some help of an epidural, because I told everyone my son is not going to stand up at graduation of high school and tell everyone that my mother birthed me without an epidural. I was even texting everyone I knew to let them know my baby was on the way. Shortly after 11 p.m., I was ready to push, and by 11.13, <coughs> excuse me, on September 6th, Jackson, sorry, Jackson was here. And as you can tell, that moment still brings me to tears. It was seriously the greatest moment of my life. He is now a healthy eight-year-old who is a carrier of the CF gene. Postpartum was tough. The first nine months were okay. Um, after that, I was on IV. I had trouble uh, keeping healthy, but finally my, my health decided to level off and become stable again. He was about three, three and a half when everything started to feel normal. So it takes a while. Um, motherhood is, is, is not easy. It's probably harder than pregnancy. Um, trying to take care of yourself, trying to raise a little one. I was trying to work full time up until this year. Um, this year I just realized something had to give and it wasn't going to be being a mummy and it wasn't going to be CF. So uh, working took a back burner just until everything can get stable again, my hope is anyway. So in the nine months I grew him, I became a new woman. Pregnancy is the most precious and beautiful experience we as women can have. I send everyone listening luck, love, and health, and peace on your journey to pregnancy and motherhood. May you feel blessed with this gift. Thanks so much for listening. Wow, thank you so much, Melissa. That was a really uh, incredible um, uh, presentation. So thanks so much for sharing your experience. Uh, we will now take questions. Uh, thank you to everyone who already sent in their questions. If there are any additional questions, please use the WebEx chat box to submit your questions and uh, I will read them aloud. Uh, our first question, uh, maybe Dr. Brown, you can um, address this. So does CF impact ovarian reserve and what does it mean for, pl for family planning? For example, is it a good idea to consider harvesting or freezing eggs early? At this point, um, this is not something that is really well researched, so it's hard to know the answer to that question. Um, I don't think that that is something uh, that we believe to be true. We believe that um, the ovaries are, are adequate, um, that most research has shown that um, that women cycle as frequently as uh, other um, uh, women. The fertility issues are thought more to be related to cervical mucus. Um, and one, you know, kind of going back to the modulator question, um, some data is showing that modulators are actually improving fertility as well. Um, because if you think about the changing in the mucus and thinning of mucus, um, some of the early data is showing that it's actually increasing fertility. Well, that's really exciting. Um, the next question is, are there any risks with using sperm or egg donors or a surrogate? Uh, um, and it's hard, well, I guess the question would be in what way? Um, I, I don't, so um, again, you have to understand what the genetics of the sperm or egg donor would be um, and not just, right? Because 
you're going to want most sperm and egg donors if they're unknown if they're unknown donors to you most of those unknown donors are going to go through screening beforehand so they're going to screen them for genetic risks um, or infectious risks uh, if they're your friends or family members that you're asking to donate you can ask that they be screened at the time of donation um, and then as far as surrogates th there's a process for screening there as well um, and you would be working with your physician provider to help you understand what those risks are. Uh, I will mention, because uh, the, the, a few of these questions are related to surrogacy versus pregnancy um, and also sperm and egg donor. Uh, I will men mention that in September we did a webinar on surrogacy and um, the use of sperm or egg donors. Uh, and that uh, was recorded, and that recording can be viewed on our the CF Canada YouTube channel. So for those who are interested in uh, listening in and watching that video, uh, they can just go to the CF Canada website uh, and then go to the uh, Fertility and Family Pla Planning webinar um, drop-down menu, and then there's a link to the YouTube channel, uh, which is where this record or the the webinar in September. Um, that recording is, and then today's um, today's webinar is also going to be on there along with um, our other webinars, so people can access that for more information. Um, but just maybe, Dr. Brown, if you have anything to add to these next couple of questions that are kind of around how to decide to go through surrogacy versus pregnancy, um, and what are some factors to consider when you're deciding to go through surrogacy versus pregnancy. Obviously, that's a very personal choice, um, and it's one that you and your partner have to sit down very carefully and think about um, and discuss with your care provider um, and take into account where your personal health is at, the, at any one particular point in time. Um, as I stated previously, mo pregnancy outcomes are you generally best when FEV1 is 50% or better. Um, so that's usually where I like to see my, my patient's lung function. And then um, BMI, you don't want a patient to be particularly underweight. Um, and then to have diabetes, you don't want um, diabetes to be um, severely out of control. So that's the place to start the conversation with your physician um, and ask, where is my health right now? So if your health in any of that is particularly um, out of control, then that would be a point at which you might want to consider, um, is, is carrying a pregnancy going to be safe for me? Another thing would be um, if you had frequent hospitalizations, frequent, you know, frequent exacerbations, that uh, require you to be in and out of the hospital, then uh, it might not be uh, terribly safe for you to carry a, a child or a, a high risk bacteria that has limited options for treatment uh, that the treatment itself, say it's um, something like a mycobacteria that's gonna require long-term IV antibiotic treatment that might potentially put uh, a, a, an infant, uh, if you're carrying an infant, that might put the infant at risk. So those would be um, things that you would really need to talk to your physician about, your care treating physician, to see if uh, that alternative would be, uh, alternative um, uh, pregnancy options would be uh, suitable for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, um, you addressed this a little bit, but so can I expect changes in my lung function throughout pregnancy and can I anticipate recovery in terms of lung function after delivery? You know, I've seen, I've seen uh, individuals lung function do everything during pregnancy. I've seen individuals have increases in lung function, decreases in lung function, or stay exactly the same. So every individual is different. Um, so I cannot, I never tell an individual what to expect. So a normal person, as I stated in my thing, a normal person goes through pregnancy. So if I were to, and I have been pregnant, I feel short, of, I felt short of breath through my pregnancy, but my lung function stayed exactly the same. Um, a patient with CS 
could it, anything could happen. So I never tell anybody what what's going to happen to their lung function in pregnancy. All right, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I just um, say what I say is we will watch and see because I've seen every I've seen in, I've seen everything happen. I've seen it go up, go down, or stay the same. That's really interesting. Um, what about sinus symptoms? Can I expect sinus symptoms worsening during pregnancy, and what can I do to better manage that? You know, um, one of the pregnancy hormones, um, progesterone, is a vas what they call a vasodilator, um, and that can cause what they call a rhinitis of pregnancy. So a lot of people get worsening sinus symptoms during pregnancy, so not, not necessarily from their cystic fibrosis, just more runny nose. So yes, you can get a lot more runny nose during pregnancy. Okay. Uh, are there any special considerations for the labor and delivery um, as well as the postpartum period? Any special considerations to think about? Again, it depends on your health and where your health is. Um, I think one thing is, and it, this, hap this is true for um, all women, but particularly true in cystic fibrosis, what, that graphic I showed about the diaphragm being positioned higher up and that there's a little bit less reserve, it means that women around the time of delivery have a greater tendency to have oxygen levels go down. So if, say, delivery gets complicated, there is a greater tendency to have low oxygen levels. So people planning delivery need to think about that. So in a patient with a chronic lung disease, there's less reserve. Um, so that needs to be, a, a, a delivery plan needs to be thought about and planned with your obstetrician and the anesthesiologist ahead of time. And it was good to hear uh, both of the patients sort of talk about you know, we had this plan, we went into this with a plan because um, otherwise, uh, without that planning, you could get into trouble pretty quickly. In the postpartum period, um, again, it was spoken very nicely. It's, and I think all new mothers know this, it's harder to have a baby than it is to be pregnant because you have, uh, you're trying to manage your complex health care with that of a baby and that baby is going to wake up every you know, two to three hours and it's gonna to need to be fed and it's gonna to need to have its diaper changed. So now you are trying to manage your complex needs and all CF patients will tell you they need, you know, rest. They need to be well rested in order to feel healthy. And new motherhood is not conducive to getting good rest. So it's that balance. And that excess fatigue that comes with new motherhood often, um, is, is very um, problematic for just getting into exacerbations. And um, I know that physiotherapy is very important. Um, I, in, in the US, as you know, we use a lot of high frequency chest wall oscillation with the vest, which cannot be worn if you're a breastfeeding mother or not a breastfeeding mother, but you, know, you can't use those mechanical things across your chest. So we have to use alternatives. Um, so any of the patients in Canada that are using any of those types of things across their breast don't, doesn't work if you're breastfeeding. So there's alternative things that you have to think about for physiotherapy um, and then around the time of uh, in the early postpartum periods as well. And I know that's not a, something that's used as much in Canada, but I know some patients use that as well. And it's a, a, a something that you need to think about in the, in the peripartum period. Uh, speaking of postpartum, just wondering if you know of any special safety precautions if you're doing inhaled medications um, around your newborn. Um, you know, you definitely want to not not um, overexpose your newborn. Most of these medications are okay, but you don't want the patient, your newborn, to have excess exposure to say albuterol and run up their heart rate or um, any of the antibiotics. They're okay to be used. As you know, mo many babies can have these medications if they were to say have cystic fibrosis, but you don't want to expose them excessively if you don't have to. Okay. 
Um, maybe, Ronna Lee, I know you talked a lot about um, the importance of maintaining a healthy weight during pregnancy, but do you have any tips on really how to uh, gain weight, um, you know, when you're trying to work around morning sickness and that kind of thing? Um, well, it's really individual. It depends on um, sort of what people's underlying issues are with their ability to gain weight prior to pregnancy. Um, if we're trying to manage symptoms, uh, most often if people are having a lot of nausea and vomiting in the first trimester, we just try to work as much as we can with um, small frequent meals, high, um, energy dense foods. Um, usually that resolves and then we can really focus on if we need to add high calorie supplements and we even had to at some point um, you know, resort to nasal gastric feeding tubes if needed for weight gain. Um, so it's really individual and you know mostly it involves people coming to clinic more frequently so we can keep closer monitoring of, of how their weight gain is going. I know a lot of the time obstetricians they focus on the baby and how well the baby's growing and most of the time that's great the baby is perfectly fine but we worry about our mom's postpartum and, and how their weight is because it really impacts their health long term so we focus and tend to be the people advocating for our pregnant patients to to really try to gain as much weight as they can and really meet the target of, of what is recommended for weight gain in pregnancy. But again, it's really individual. Um, so spending time with your team and talking to the dietitians and the doctors um, to help find the best ways to help manage symptoms and gain weight is what we, we recommend. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so maybe we'll just have time for a couple more questions and then we'll wrap things up. Again, if anybody has any questions, please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen there and you can take them in and I will read them out. Um, you both talked a lot about medications and what is safe during pregnancy. Just wondering if there, if there does need to be any changes in, in medication before becoming pregnant, how far in advance do those changes need to be made before it's safe to become pregnant? Um, it depends on the medication, I would say. If it's a, a medicine that's clearly teratogenic, known to cause birth defects, then as soon as you decide you want to become pregnant, then you should stop that medication. If it's a medication that um, may or may not, say say you're the person who's like, you know, I'm, I don't feel 100% comfortable about modulators. So as soon as I find out I'm pregnant, I, I think I'm going to stop my modulator. So I, I think it depends on your, I think it depends on the medication, but if it's one that's clearly teratogenic, you need to stop that as soon as you go off birth control. Um, and other, and, and you know, I'll defer to Rana Lee on some of the medications, like if it's a vitamin or, or, or nutritional. Um, aside from just monitoring levels pre-pregnancy, just to ensure all fat-soluble vitamin levels are within target, um, it's really a recommendation is for people to start folic acid as soon as they are actively trying to become pregnant or stop using birth control. Okay. I don't see any other additional questions through the chat, so I think um, given the time, I think we will wrap things up. Uh, I just wanted to thank Dr. Brown, Ronna Lee, Melissa, and Emily for taking the time to speak to us on fertility and family planning for people living with cystic fibrosis. There's really not a ton of information out there for people with CF to access, um, so having the opportunity to listen to you all speak today is really, really valuable, so thank you so much. Uh, and thank you uh, to all of you who are tuning in today. Our fertility and family planning webinar series will continue in the new year. We invite you to keep an eye on our Facebook page for more information on the series. Uh, all questions can be directed to advocacy at cystifibrosis.ca if you have any questions about the webinars. Uh, this webinar was recorded and will be made available for future viewing. Again, if you go to the CF Canada uh, YouTube channel. Uh, at this point, I think we will finish, so thank you all so much.